I will record here. All right, let's start. ज्ञान तिरंदस्या ज्ञान अंजन चला गया चक्षर मिल तम ये नस्मे श्री गुरु न महा श्री चैतन्य मनोविष्ट स्थापित मे न भूतले स्वयं रूपा गदा मह्यम ददाति स्वदांतिका हे कृष्णा कर्ण सिंधु दीन बंधु जगत पते गोपेश गोपिका कांता राधा कांता नमस्ते सप्तकांचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी विश्वानुस्ते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंदा श्री अद्वैत गदाधार शिव साधि गौर भक्ति वृंदा हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे तमाम विष्णु पदाया कृष्ण पृष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमत भक्ति वेदांता स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष श्रीवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे so we are uh, doing the this section right section d i'll go little uh, quick a little fast today because uh, i want to finish this chapter this is going to be class 4 for chapter 2 till which verse did we finish 2.4 what and your mother said till where did we finish 2.44 Okay, so I'll go a little quick. Okay, in case you find that it's very quick, any one of you, please feel free to stop me. Mataji, by the way, this is the third class, Mataji, not fourth one. Third class. Okay, thank you. Okay. This bhoga um so bhoga and ashwarya the yeah we discussed this I remember thank you. So. i think we are clear that in this section krishna is talking about um, rising above the language of the vedas uh, because the vedic language is what what does vedic language do it can be very confusing okay it, it may not one may not actually and come to the end of the vedas which is to uh, which is krishna right vedesh sarve aham eva vedya uh the vedic principles are given the varnashram system is given for devotees who are in the conditioned state but it doesn't mean that we st we get stuck there okay we'll study all that later and krishna says that if arjun is thinking that if uh, i am going to come uh, and only worship krishna what about all the other rituals and all the other you know details given in the vedas what will happen to that so krishna knows this so he answers this as all purposes small uh, well all all purposes can be served by small well sorry the english is not right there by great reservoir of as all purposes small well krishna sorry i should have checked it as all purposes as which are served by small well can be served by great reservoir of water similarly all the purposes of the vedas can be served to one who knows the purpose behind them basically um, uh krishna says this this is a content of bhagavad gita summarized right that this particular point also comes up in uh later chapters do you know which chapter it comes up where krishna reads arjun's mind and and, and arjun might think that okay what about all the other uh, vedic literate uh, rituals all the other sanskaras if i only become krishna conscious then what will happen i think it's the last verse of sixth chapter when krishna talks about it okay uh um, and then this is a very famous verse you have performed to uh, prescribe uh, perform to your prescribed duty but not uh, entitled to the fruits of your action which is paritarnay sadhu naam who knows the verse vinashay cha dushkatam dharm who knows the verse i know mata ji hare go krishna ahead. go ahead परित्राणाय साधु नाम विनाशाय चुष्कृता 
one person has a right to perform their duty. Okay, um, but the fruits of the duty or fruits of the action are not in one's hand. So Arjun is asked, because he's focusing too much on the result of the fight, right? Is it not that he's focusing too much on the result of the fight that if uh, I win the war, then such and such people will be dead and gone? And uh, even if I win the war, there's no there's no enjoyment. If I win the war, then the family life, uh, the tradition of the family will be uh, tradition of the family will be what do you say destroyed like that. So he's uh, he's thinking too much about the result. And now Krishna makes it very clear, mm -hmm. which actually is uh, true in our life as well, if you study, that sometimes we worry too much about the result and we get so much frozen about the result that we actually don't perform the duty. Or Prabhupada talks about three kinds of duties in the purport. What are the three kinds of duties that Prabhupada talks about? Which kind of work? Routine work, capricious work, and... Emergency work. Um, routine work, capricious work, and emergency work. I think you're right. It is routine work, capricious work. I hope everyone read before they came. Routine, capricious, prescribed duties, capricious work, and inaction. Okay, Prabhupada talks about prescribed duties, capricious work, and inaction in the uh, puppet. So, prescribed duties is religious activities. Capricious work is something which should not be done. Inaction is sinful. Okay. So remember this, that where is my right? Where is the boundary drawn? Where is the line? The right is only in the performance of the duty. So with that, Arjun is not supposed to not fight. Okay. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, inaction, capricious work, or prescribed duty. So prescribed duty is action which is based on one's mode at birth. Routine, so prescribed duty is divided into routine work, emergency work, and desired activity. And routine work is something which is performed as disinterested obligatory duty, which is out of the mode of goodness. And it's uh, and one has to perform the duty, but do not get attached to the result. Okay, cause of bondage and inauspicious is to get attached to the result. If one is very attached to the result, then that actually causes bondage. And bondage is responsible, and that attachment is responsible for the cause of action. And then we lead. So basically, what it means, what Prabhupada writes in the purport, if I'm too much focused on the result of the work, then it leads to, it actually makes me responsible for the work itself. And if I'm responsible for the work and the result of the work, then I have to suffer or enjoy the result action, which actually does not lead me out of this world. Capricious work is we karma, which is not uh, prescribed in the shastras, and inaction is not performing the prescribed duty. Which Krishna talks about eight in chapter work in the three modes: goodness, passion, ignorance. So when someone is in the inaction, what mode of nature is that? You remember from chapter eighteenth. What mode of nature is that? Tamas. Yeah, nice. Ignorance. Very good. Yeah. Okay, then Krishna describes the definition of yoga here. Perform your duty, equipoise, abandoning all attachment to success or failure. Such equanimity is called yoga. Equanimity means having a samadarshana, like equal vision. It doesn't matter whether one is going to lose or gain the fight. Or in our case, whether my uh, endeavor is going to be successful or not successful, the only result I can, the only duty I can do is to try, to try for Krishna. Abandoning all attachment to success or failure. Prabhupada defines the word as an attachment as what? And then he says, actually detachment is also an other side of attachment. Don't think if somebody is detached that that's, they're not attached. They're actually attached to the detachment. So basically, one has to surrender. That's the that's the state of equipoised, um, equipoised bent. So attachment, Prabhupada describes as desire to be the enjoyer. 
I want to be the enjoyer. That's how Brahma describes. Okay, I'll quickly go over this. Um, so, uh, Krishna then describes, this is the part of the uh, chapter where bhakti is introduced in a very small section. And of course, the, Krishna describes the qualities of a devotee, uh, which is in the 12th, uh, which is in uh, forthcoming verses uh, from verse 51 to, I think, 70, but which are more elaborated in chapter 12. That what are the qualities of a devotee where he says, this is very dear to me, very, very dear to me, like, like that. So the summary is over there. So keep about all abominable activities for distant by devotional service, which is called Buddha Yoga. And in that consciousness, surrender unto the Lord. Those who want to enjoy the fruits of their work are misers. First, he gives a word of instruction. I really like the way Krishna speaks. <laughs> First, he gives a word of instruction. Don't be attached to the result of your activity because you're only entitled to be uh, to do the activity. Then he says, Devel develop a attachment or don't be attached to become equipoised to all success or failure and then he reveals why why one should not be attached to the fruits because people who are attached to the fruits are misers okay they don't give their full hundred percent they just focus on the result they don't give their full potential in service to krishna okay and Prabhupada defines the definition of a miser is they do not know how to engage their asset acquired by good fortune or hard labor in service of Krishna. And then he gives example, human energy should be used for Krishna consciousness, but misers want to enjoy the fruitive work. That's the definition of a miser, that they have it, but they're not going to do it because they don't know how to do it or engage in Krishna's service. Um, and this is a, a man engaged in devotional service, rids himself of both good and bad reaction, even in this life, therefore strive for yoga, which is the art of all work. So both good and bad. You know, uh, my spiritual master said that at the time of my initiation, he said, uh, generally people come to Krishna consciousness or people come to uh, devotional service to with the intention that we will get rid of our bad karma. Right? We, our karma gets minimized. But he said at the time, at the time I remember that actually... Initiation is a process which gets one rid of both good and bad karma. So both good and bad karma are gone. Okay. It's not that just the good the bad karma is gone. Uh, so it's not just that. So I was like very surprised. And then I, I before I wanted to uh before I wanted to like say something Gurmaj explained that how both good and bad karma keep one bonded in the material world but the process of initiation is a process which actually opens up that path because the door is locked right uh, but the shelter of a spiritual master can actually It actually um, shows us shows us the path of bhakti, the shining path of bhakti, which is leading us to Krishna. Okay, so this is very important. Understand, uh, Bhakti Tita Maharaj said that most of the people come to Krishna consciousness to feel comfortable. You know, okay, I'm doing devotional service to Krishna, then I would not have any problems in my life. I will have peace of mind. Uh, I'll be able to maintain my mental equanimity. But that's not what Krishna consciousness is really about. Uh, Krishna consciousness is about... Uh, Krishna consciousness is about actually uh, serving Krishna. But we get attached to too many side benefits, right? There are... In, in Nectar of Devotion, we will study uh, that when one engages in pure devotional service, then what happens? Kleshagni. What is the meaning of the word Kleshagni? What is the meaning of the word Kleshagni? Klesha Agni. Kleshagni. Uh-huh. This is this is not a good time for class. I think I keep repeating the same raga every 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 class. 
And these are the people who are like experts already in Bhagavad Gita. It's not like I'm taking like an introduction to Bhagavad Gita. Of course, we get introduced to Krishna consciousness in Bhagavad Gita every day. That's there, but still. Kleshagni means like getting rid of the difficulties. The difficulties like Klesha means difficulty. Right? Agni means destruction. So the process which leads to destruction of the difficulties. But that's a side benefit. It's not the real benefit. Because real benefit is Shri Krishna Karshani, right? So it attracts Krishna. But we forget that. So this has to be understood very well. That by engaging in devotional service, one gets rid of both good and bad reactions, even in this life. Both of them are gone. So it's not okay because of my good karma, I was supposed to become super rich. You won't now. Prabhupada gives it from his own life, example from his own life, right? That um, he had a good prospect of becoming very rich. Um, he had his chemical factory and uh, everything was doing very, everything was going very well. Uh, but Krishna dismantled everything, right? His factory caught fire, there was a short circuit and then he had to leave his family and become a sannyasi. So both good and bad reactions. That is very rare. It doesn't happen to everybody. It's very rare. But if it happens, then the person or the devotee has an intelligence to take it as a mercy of Krishna. So five benefits of acting in, in Buddhi Yoga is freedom from uh, a good and bad reactions. Uh, you can take a photo of this slide or I can share it if you want. And then uh, 51st verse, freedom from the cycle of birth and death. 52nd is indifferent to Vedic rituals. What doesn't need, it is not obligated anymore for any kind of Vedic rituals. But we are talking about pure devotional service. We are not talking about mixed devotional service. Then relationship of Krishna, with, uh, re realization of relationship with Krishna as eternal servitor, which is 53rd verse. And then 72nd verse is a prediction of going back to Godhead. So these are the five benefits of acting in Buddhi Yoga. Okay, so I will come to the last section. And this is a very important verse, which I expect all of you to read. When your intelligence has passed through, a pass out of the dense forest of delusion, you shall become indifferent to all that has been heard and all that is to be heard. Okay, what does it mean? Has passed out of the dense forest of delusion. This dense forest of delusion means what? It's shown in the slide too. When your intelligence has passed out of the dense forest of delusion, what is the dense forest of delusion referring to here? Hmm? Huh? Our attachments and desires. Okay. Okay. What have we? What have we been talking about? All these verses. What have we been talking about? Krishna. In this section our of our karma, Gita. our karmas. It's been talking about the Vedas, right? Vedic hymns. So the Vedic hymns is considered to be the dense forest of delusion because it leads to this. You you are looking at it, right? That uh, religiosity, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. So religiosity leads to economic development, which one gives sense gratification. And then ultimately one leads to liberation. So dharma gives artha, artha gives kama, kama gives, and then kama leads, frustration of kama leads to liberation. But that's not what Krishna is talking about. He's not talking about dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Because you shall become indifferent to all that has been heard and all that is to be heard. When one becomes a pure devotee, one is not attracted to the language of the Vedas. Okay, so karma Khan section. Uh, Vedas are revealed scriptures, which really, this is the dense process of delusion. Uh, lead, teach us about the Karmakan section. Karmakan section of the Vedas is something which is compared to the dense forest of delusion. Because Karmakan section tells us about the fruity benefits and how to avoid material pains, which results, but the result is cycle of birth and death. But actual purpose of Vedas, Vedas to survey Ahameva Vedya. So, Vedesh to Sarve, Ahameva Vedya. Actual purpose of the Vedas is to know the difference between body and soul and purpose of life and then progress towards liberation. But we get distracted. We get to this red part of this light. That's dense forest of delusion. You should be able to understand what's dense forest of delusion, okay? 
And that is why in this verse, he calls the language of the Vedas to be flowery. Because it actually leads to fulfillment of the desire. And then when somebody is fixed in self-realization, then one would have attained the divine consciousness. And it's not interested in uh, uh, pursuing the Vedic pathway of sense gratification. A pure devotee. If somebody is still interested, that's fine. Don't like, you know, don't, no need to have self-criticism, but understand that we are not pure devotees because I still have a desire, okay? So at this point, uh, Krishna asks, Arjuna asks the question. These are the questions which Arjuna asks. Actually, I should have opened the other slide because he becomes interested in knowing that person whose, whose consciousness is fixed in the divine. What are the questions asked? What are the symptoms of a person? Who is such situated? Symptoms of a Sita Pragya. How does he talk? What is his language? How does he sit? And how does he walk? So when he says, how does he talk? How does he walk? How does he sit? What does it really mean? This is what it means. Symptoms. What? How does he reveal his position? Prabhupada writes in the purport that everybody have a symptom. And the most important element of a symptom, uh, most important element of one's position is judged by one's speech. And he gives an analogy that a foolish person and an intelligent person are, dis are indistinguishable until they speak. So how, speak language means what? What does it mean when Arjuna asks this question? How does he speak? Means how does he react to the action of others? And when he says, what is, how does this sit, means what? How, mentality, when senses are withdrawn from sense objects, how is it situated? You know, when we're not getting, the demand of the senses is not getting met, then how is that person situated in consciousness? How does this walk? How does he walk? Means how does he engage his senses in Krishna's service? So these are the questions asked in 54th verse and the answers are given in these verses. The answer of symptom is given in verse 55. The answer of how does he talk, what is his language, is how does he react to actions of others. How does he sit? Mentality when senses are withdrawn from sense objects, how is it situated? And then, and then from verse 58 to 63, and then 64 to 61 answers engage in senses. It is also in your handbook. Uh, the student handbook, it is also in in that like the table is given, and this is the this is the symptom. This is a symptom when a man gives up all varieties of desire for sense gratification, which arise from mental concoction. So Krishna has given a liner here: desire for sense gratification is arising from mental concoction. It's not real. So person has been able to give up that, able to separate. And when his mind thus purified, finds satisfaction in the self alone, then, then he said to be in pure transcendental consciousness. Purified, you know, we have invented so many processes in today's world to counteract uh, suffering, right? To develop this mindset, uh, to have motivation to work, to develop goals, the science, and technology has advanced to give us comforts. You can just press button and, and get so much achieved just by pressing buttons or this app or that app. But all these comforts are the main aim of giving comfort from science and technology is to give people a chance to save time, right? And when the expectation will be if somebody has more time, then they will be able to uh, lead more peaceful life. But is that what we are seeing? Is that what we are seeing? That as science and technology is advancing and people do have more time in their hands uh, as compared to 50 years ago, 20 years ago, are they becoming more peaceful as they were before 20 years ago or something? Is that what you see in, around you? No, no Mataji. They're becoming more, more and more lazy, in fact. So, yeah, I, okay. Oh, what else do you see? Laziness and what else? And they are not happy, even though they have all yeah. the gadgets. You know, 
लाईक मोस्ट ऑफ द गॅजेट्स आर क्रिएटिंग मोर प्रॉब्लेम वॉट्सॲप अँड एफ बी अँड यु नो वेन दे सी अदर पीपल दे पोज दे पिक्चर्स दे एन्जॉइंग अँड दिस अँड दॅट दे फील ओ लाईक वी आर नॉट एन्जॉइंग यु नो something yes. like that so there is a uh, the expectation for enjoyment or uh, to enjoy the material world you know is increasing as if it has no limits yes so very good thank you so we are becoming more and more unhappy um the the, the diagnosis of the, men- the mental health diagnosis has gone up by 150% in europe post covid 100 more 150% rise in mental health diagnosis and what was i reading because of the increased use of gadgets the frontal lobe of the brain is becoming more and more less active because the frontal lobe of the brain is is responsible for socialization so i was reading in the journal that um, actually we are responsible for shrinking our brain capacity by using these gadgets we are getting used by them not using used getting used by them so get krishna's formula no this is krishna's formula of actually becoming happy that give all variety give up all varieties as desire for sense gratification proper explains in the purport that 529 is the answer to the peace uh, question in the world that krishna is the only enjoyer he is the only enjoyer is the only proprietor everyone else is secondary Okay, Sita Pragna, the, I think this is from, we made this uh, from the puppet. So no need to go over, but actually try to become uh, more, less and less sen- uh, adopted to the sense gratification. Not more and more and more. How much can I have? How much can I have? How much can I have? No. Okay, and then this is the answer to what? we have to i have to go back and repeat this slide 50 so 56 to 57 is the speech somebody has to remember this maybe i have my notes here okay i have my notes here so 56 to 57 so verse number 55 is the answer to what tell me quickly when krishna says uh that when somebody is detached from the mental con- uh, sense gratification ideas arising from mental concoction and is fixed in the self um then that person is the pragna so verse number 55 was an answer to what question of arjun 55 is how does he reveal his position 55 is symptom how what is symptoms, the symptoms? Yes. the pragna is the ka yes, how does he reveal his position yes And 56 to 57 is how does he react to the other how does he speak the speech very good mm-hmm. so one who is not disturbed in mind even amidst the three threefold miseries or related when there is happiness and who is free from attachment fear anger is called sage of steady mind in this particular chapter krishna mentions about freedom from attachment fear anger and then he mentions about freedom from aversion and attachment two times Okay, one is this verse number 56 and I think the other verse is verse number 60. And then this is more elaborately explained in 4th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, chapter, verse number 10. Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha Manmaya Bhav Upashitaha. So, so this is very important. Something which is mentioned so many times in Bhagavad Gita must hold more importance. That not to get, uh, you know, disturbed so even happiness is a disturbance of the mind can you believe that one who is not disturbed in the mind in even admits the threefold miseries or elated when there is happiness so both are cancelled that doesn't mean that one becomes a shunyavadi no it means that one is deriving happiness from something else okay so i want to go so uh, this is um, we didn't get the verses of 50 yeah yeah i remember okay understand that how does a person uh, speak or react when something uh, of the senses demand of the senses is not met is that that person is not disturbed and is perfectly fixed in perfect knowledge and that is definition of samadhi samadhi means always steady in the determination to become krishna conscious 58 to 63 is the answer to what 
is written there. Sit. How does he sit? Somebody is paying attention. So I'm telling you, you need to postpone your lunch on the days we have 3 p.m. class, okay, people in India. Withdraw senses from sense objects. How is that person able to withdraw? And what is the analogy given? What is the analogy which is oh, given sorry. by Shabrabad? Huh? The tortoise. tortoise. Well, why tortoise? Why tortoise? What's so important about tortoise? It withdraws its legs. Mm -hmm. Withdraws its all his body parts, you no know, hand, legs, head, everything. Yeah. So that at its own will, it comes out of the shell, and at its own will, it comes back. So a devotee, a pure devotee, does not get driven by the uncontrolled senses. Actually, controls the direction of the senses, and then when the goal of the, of using that particular sense is met, you come back, or they come back to uh, be fixed in the goal of uh, of uh, Krishna consciousness. It's not that a person is not going to become agitated by looking at Rasgulla and Pani Puri and, you know, Tikki and all that stuff. Uh, because the person's goal is very clear. The tongue is not going to drive them to go here, there, everywhere. Uh, because they're fixed. And I'm not here to do all these things. I'm here to um, serve Krishna. Okay. So this also explains embodied soul. This is a warning, actually. Uh, don't try to fake it. Uh, we can we can try to fake it, right? We may know. Okay, I'm become a sthita pragna. You bring pizza in front of me. You bring you know nice uh, clothes and jewelry in front of me. You bring nice everything. I'm not going to be disturbed. Krishna says, ah, uh -uh, be careful, because an embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, but the taste for sense enjoy sense objects remains. And Prabhupada gives an analogy of what over there. This verse can be understood to be something similar to the position of a... What is the analogy given? That the embodied soul is restricted from sense enjoyment, but the taste for sense objects remain. What is it? Uh, that's an issue. And yes, a sick patient. Okay. A person who is sick uh, is asked to restrict from eating certain foodstuffs. But that doesn't mean that the person doesn't want to eat. It's just that they're restricted for now. So how do we actually come out of that conflict that, okay, or give up that taste? And By developing taste. higher taste. Very nice. Which is Param Dishtva Nivartate. So Krishna is giving us complete knowledge. He tells us the solution, but he also tells us the problem with the solution. And he tells us the solution to the problem. You understand? He says that, okay, how does a person sit? The person is sitting like a tortoise, which is able to withdraw its senses from sense objects. But that doesn't mean just by withdrawing the senses from sense object doesn't make one a pure devotee. Because the taste will still be there. But how do we actually get rid of the taste is developing a higher taste in Krishna consciousness. And how does it happen? Not by sitting at home, just chanting Hare Krishna. Yes, chanting Hare Krishna has a potency, but we are not chanting at the Nam um, uh, Abhas level or Shuddha Nam level. We are chanting at Nam Aparad level. I was listening to Prabhupada's lecture yesterday. Prabhupada was saying chanting Hare Krishna has all potency. But the problem is we are not chanting like that. We are not chanting like Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur was chanting to purify the world. But we are chanting. So what is our chanting? Prabhupada brought up this question in the lecture. This is in teachings of Queen Kunti. I was listening to his class. What, what is our chanting then? Huh? You know, if you are not chanting like Haridas Thakur, then, then what are we chanting for? What are we chanting for, huh? You don't ask this question. If you're not chanting like Hazas Thakur, what are we chanting for? Any guesses? Our own Shuddhi. Yeah, very yeah. nice. Cheto Darpana Marjanam. Yeah, we are chanting for our own purification. We must remember that. It's like taking medication. Is it a very, uh, it's, it's like because somebody is sick, somebody has developed some ailment, you take, they take medication so that the ailment is either you know, suppressed or removed. But uh, a healthy person doesn't need to take medication. 
So like that, we are trying to regain our spiritual health. Okay, then for verse number 6, 58 to 63. Oh, we are still in the sit for sitting part. Uh, the senses are very strong. Krishna gives an, another danger thing. And don't think that even if you have developed a higher taste, the strength of the senses is not there. It's there. Actually, even if somebody is trying to become Krishna conscious, then the mind can forcibly carry uh, a man because of the desire for senses, gratification, gratification, a man who is actually trying to control the mind. That person can also get deviated. And examples, these are the examples given. The sage Durvasa, you know, he is a devotee in its true sense. Durvasa Muni is respected in Shiman Bhagavatam. But then he has this pride, you know, six enemies of the mind. Pride is one of the enemies. And pride leads to anger. So, and then he insults a pure devotee. So he carries it, he does the wrong act. And Vishwamitra is trying to meditate and become Krishna conscious, but then he gets distracted by Menka. But Maharaj Ambarish or Yamnacharya are not getting distracted. Why? Because they have really fully engaged their senses in Krishna service. So devotional service is an active term. It's not a passive term. Okay, Prabhupada, I have only read it in Prabhupada's writings that he is translating bhakti as an action, devotional service, not just saying devotion. Mostly, if you read other literatures, bhakti is translated as devotion. Yeah? But if you read and, and study Shri Prabhupada and his teachings, he's saying bhakti is devotional service, not devotion, devotional service, action. Because that actually, you know, one instruction of Prabhupada covers all these things which are underneath. Can you believe? Like it's called coding, right? Coding um, is like, coding is something like this, right? You they, The person who's coding presents, anybody who codes here, I don't code, but I, what I understand from my friends who code that you're given this particular uh, small, let's say you punch these numbers so you'll be able to access the door or the safe account, just punch. So the coding has, um, in a particular fashion, has made this lock. And But you can unlock it by this combination and then you can enter into the world of jewels and everything, right? Like that, Prabhupada words are power-packed. There's so much power behind it and then it's saving us from all these things that Krishna is explaining. So do devotional service. What is it? I was listening to a lecture yesterday. It said, generally, devotional service means that we are supposed to actually act. What does he say? Maharaj said, kathanam uh, and then mopanam dishwashingam. You know, you listen to Harikatha, but I also go to the temple and mop the floor and also go and wash the dishes. But we actually, what we are doing right now is katanam. We listen to the <laughs> harikatha and then katanam and we cut it and then paste them. So we are, you know, listening, cutting and pasting and then talking like a parrot. But that's not, we're actually supposed to listen, go to the temple, mop the floor and wash the dishes. That's devotional service. <laughs> okay, this so is the man Katanam, mopanam, dishwashanam. <laughs> yeah, that's what Maya was saying. So Maya said intelligence is restrained, uh, uh, restrains the senses, keeps them under control, and matparaha. Matparaha is an active word, fixed upon Krishna conscious. Uh, I'm leaving a lot for you to read because I really want to finish the chapter. Uh, so the now verse number 58 to 63 is answer to what? How does he walk? When we say how does he walk, what does it mean? Hmm? What does it mean when he, Arjun says, Krishna, how does 63 this was to sit, Mataji. 58 to 63 is how does it, oh, still in the sit. Then why is he, why is, then this is wrong. 64, yeah, you're right. In my, in my note, 64 to 71 is how does he walk. So sorry, this is yep. a mistake. He should still be sitting. But uh, again, revising, because people in India must have dozed off by now. What When we say sitting means what? Sitting means what? How does a person sit? Mentally, whose senses are withdrawn from sense objects. 
so how does he is he situated when uh, yeah how does that person restrain the senses from sense objects yeah how do you, do you do that mm -hmm. so that by, what is the verdict what is the verdict of how does that person sit what is the final line by developing devotional service devotional service thank you very much somebody understood Active word, right? devotional service. All these verses, 58 to 63, are like telling that uh, the devotional service. And I think, is this the verse uh, which is Dhyayate Vishya Nipunsa Sangasta Sanjayate? Is this the verse? Yes, Mataji. Okay, I will show another slide for that. I think we have a better one in under Sangeeta 18 day glasses. Uh, while developing, I'll sh maybe I should just show it right now. Let me just open it up. So, Dhyayate Vishan Punsa Sangasta Sanjayate Sangas. Who knows the verse? Sangasta Sanjayate Kama. Who knows the verse? Kama Krodo Vijayate. Uh huh. And then? Then? Kroda. Kroda Bhavati Samoha. 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 Very nice. So, what does it mean? Dhyayate Vishyan Punsaha means what? Contemplating <laughs> on Mataji. I'm sorry? Contemplating on objects. Like we we, yes. we want to get that object somehow. Yes. So, contemplating the objects of the sense gratification. One develops attachment for them. And by developing attachment, what happens? Let me just open the slides. Give me a second. What happens while developing or attach, uh, uh, contemplating one develops attachment. From attachment, what happens? Lust. Lust. Kama. Kama. Lust. Yes. Lust. What is lust the definition of lust? What is the definition of De lust? Desire. Yeah. What? Like what desire? Desire for? Krishna Kaviraj Goswami Prabhupada explains the definition of lust in Chitana Chaitamrita. Uh, what does it mean? Anything that we do for ourselves, um, it's called, uh, I mean, if Krishna is not involved, then it is called lust, Mataji. If it is in, Krishna is involved, then it is love. Very, very nice. So something which, activity which is performed for one's personal sense gratification is called lust. And the activity which is performed for, uh, for um, Krishna's, uh, Krishna's pleasure is called love. Which Krishna Kaviraj Goswami also defines love as an active active word, not as a passive word. Uh, so these are the verses. Dhyayate Vishyan Punsaha Sangasta Sanjayate Sangasta Sanjayate Sangasta Sangasta Sanjayate Kama Kama Krodha Dvijayate Krodha Bhavati Samoha Samoha Smriti Vibhrishitam Smriti Bhimrashat Buddhi Nasho Buddhi Nashat Pranashayati. So these are the eight step all down. While contemplating the object of the senses, one develops attachment. And by developing the attachment, lust arises. It means one becomes very strong in conviction that I am supposed to be the enjoyer. This is all for me. And from lust, because lust is never satisfied, burns like fire. Mode of, you know, lust is in what mode? What mode of nature is it? Passion. 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 And then, then, and then, and when it degrades, it leads to anger. And anger is in what mode? Ignorance. ignorance. Passion and ignorance, both. Passion and ignorance. These are the crux. And from anger, delusion arises. Means one actually loses the ability to distinguish. And from delusion, bewilderment of the memory. And when the memory becomes bewildered, one loses the intelligence. What is the function of intelligence? Function of the mind is thinking, feeling, willing. What is the function of intelligence? Discrimination. Discrimination. So one is not able to discriminate whether the next step that I'm going to take is going to be is, is going to be right or wrong. Even moral discrimination is lost and then one falls down or commits the simple activity, right? Radha Atmana says anger is one word less than danger. So if you put D in front of it, it's like danger, right? So um, this is Krishna says that this is the answer to what? How does a person sit? And then also going overlapping into how does a person walk? 
Okay, so we come back to our original slides. This is the process of falling down in this material world. We are already in trouble and then we invite more trouble. Okay, so I'll I'll continue that uh, verse number 64 to 71 is an answer to what? How does he walk? Engage his senses. Means? How does he huh, walk? Means what? How does he walk? Means what? What does it mean? How does he engages his senses? Yes, very nice. So how does he walk means how the senses are engaged. You know, are they walking to the market uh, to buy objects of sense gratification or they are walking to the market to preach Krishna consciousness. Both the walking to market is okay, but what, are, what is the purpose going there? That doesn't mean we don't do grocery for our house or we don't upkeep the house, but understand, okay, don't become a fanatic. Oh, this is the verse. 64 is the verse where Krishna talks about attachment and aversion. Again, so, person is free from attachment and aversion, which is equal to equipoised mind, right? And able to control the senses uh, through the regulatory principles of freedom. So, the regulatory principles that Prabhupada has given us are actually called as regulatory principles of freedom. But people think that they are the regulatory principles of bondage, so regulating, not drinking tea and coffee. How is that even possible? Right? Not eating onion and garlic. Oh my God, that's too much to ask. But actually, this regulatory principle of freedom, we don't understand. But if we are able to follow that, not for the sake of becoming a so called good person or earning respect from others, that, oh, you're able to go on without drinking tea or coffee. No, no, no. But we are actually following these regular principles to obtain complete mercy of the Lord. Is Krishna attracted by this austerity or not is the main thing. Okay. Another conditioned soul getting attracted to another conditioned soul quality without developing attraction to Krishna is actually uh, at the very surface level. You know, do you know the distinction between what are the two things people do? Snorkeling and what is the other thing? Diving? Snor is snorkeling and dive what is what is more superficial snorkeling is snorkeling more activity more like they take you inside the water but it's not deep water mm. and then you're snorkeling able to see is the on the surface just the surface then you have yes then you have to dive further down yeah so I really enjoy it. yeah and scuba but Scuba diving, yeah, thank you. Yes, scuba diving. So snorkeling. So you can be in Krishna God. Some people, I heard this also yesterday. My gosh. Some people come to Krishna consciousness just to test the water, okay? Thoda, thoda. Don't, don't get too serious. Thoda, thoda. So, so they test the water. It's like snorkeling. And then, okay, God is there. I'm there and my life is there. Thank you, God. I'll come when I can. So go some people that's like compared to like just touching the water of the ocean some people actually go deep in the ocean they go deep in the ocean and they may be surrounded by other people who are also very serious in their practice of krishna consciousness but they still may be in a bubble even though they are in association of the devotees even though they're following the process even though they might have might have taken initiation as well you know, showing the process of uh, showing the seriousness, just just not going being serious. But they still might be in a bubble. That okay, I'm gonna uh, you know take initiation and do my own thing and try to control, not get too attached to anybody around me. That is also not touching the surface, but not going to the depth as well. That's like if you study the marine animals. Some of them are just on the surface. Some of them are, are swimming in the superficial water, not at the depth. But Rupa Goswami Prabhupada tells us in Nectar of Devotion that our acharyas are compared to makara. Huh? Makara. So what is a makara? What is the closest word of makara in English? The animal. Shark. Yeah. 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 Shark. It's not literally a shark. But it's some. But the closest word is shark. You know, in Damodar Lila, Krishna wears earrings of makara, makara earrings. So that's like the... the. So, Krupa Goswami Prabhupada says, our acharyas are like makara. They're very, very deep in the ocean. They don't want to come to the surface. Uh, 
So a Krishna conscious person is like that. So are we in the surface level or are we at the superficial water like swimming inside the water but not too deep or are we really, really deep in the process and adopted it in our life? So, or the other example is snorkeling and scuba diving. Now, what are we doing? So these regulatory principles of freedom, one may be following, but maybe still be swimming at the surface level. Not like at the surface, but in the superficial waters. Just because it attracts some attention from other people that, oh, you're great. You don't really like smoke. You don't touch wine. In, in foreign countries, it's a big deal. I think in India also, it's becoming a big deal nowadays. huh? Or you don't like eat onion and garlic. So many restrictions. You're great. But, <laughs> but that's not the whole deal, you know. We go more deep. Why are we not doing it? Because I want to obtain complete mercy of Krishna. Have I obtained that or not? And then become satisfied in Krishna consciousness and then there are no uh, more threefold miseries and in that consciousness one is to soon established in Krishna consciousness or divine consciousness. You have your hand raised. Nikhil Prabhu, you, you have a question? Yes, Mataji. <coughs> Regarding this onion and garlic. Yeah. You know, no, I'm not discussing right. onion and garlic. I'm saying regulatory principles of freedom is one of the regulatory principles. <laughs> Go <appreciate> ahead. <laughs> I get this question, especially uh, from the uh, elderly people. They said, men, they need, uh, uh, when they age, they are low in testosterone. For their own body function, they need at least onion, you know, to perform. What should I, you know, that's something that I'm not able to. Where is the reference that, I, that onion is responsible for? You see, okay, there are two ways of answering this question. The onion one is like, let's say, talking at the material level, why onion garlic are not good. And then talking, if somebody is ready to really understand the Krishna conscious reason, you have to gauge the uh, pressure to who you're talking to. Are they ready to hear the Shastrik version or are they or they are still ready to just hear the medical part or the moral part? So medically, onion and garlic are rich in sulfur. You know, when people are peeling them, don't their eyes get irritated? Right? And, uh, and the hands become very like itchy or burning if somebody is touching it constantly. Why? Because it's rich in sulfur. And it actually, and sulfur is needed for uh, preparation of the medications. If you actually study the pharmacology, the sulfur, uh, hydrogen sulfide or sulfur components, sulfates, or sulfites, even in our food, preserved food, all these are acting as preservatives. They keep the thing bonded and increases the shelf life of a thing. So, but excess of the sulfur is actually toxic to neurons in the brain. Yeah, it's actually toxic to the neurons in the brain. It's been proven. And, and how is it proven? You can go and go on and on and on. Because where the our brain, it develops from the same... Uh, how do you say, level, same layer from where our intestines develop. You know how the, when the fetus is developing, the same cells that give rise to the neurons give rise to the intestine. So whatever is going in the gut is actually going to the brain. And if you study the association be, be, behind people who develop all these mental health, uh, all these um, uh, brain degenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, if it's been really well studied in today's era, if you go back and retrace their diet when they were younger, yes, there is a genetic component, but that's not very strong because people who don't have a gen family history of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's also develop these diseases. If you trace back their diet, they figure out that the diet was very, very rich in sulfur, extremely rich. And then the gut cells have modified and so are the neurons in the brain. So this degenerating. Eventually it leads to, okay, you might have a high testosterone, but you're going to have a degenerative brain disorder. So if you have to choose between a head and testosterone, I think the intelligent person will choose the head. So, okay, that's like a medical reason. And the other thing is, where is it? I have not studied, you know. I practice as a physician. I have never studied that onion. And even if it is, even if it is, then you're not going to make medicine as your food. 
you know is it like okay uh, it's let give me a sweet dish of anti hypertensive pills give me like 20 of those <laughs> are you going to eat it like that are you going to eat a medicine as a food or a diet or a medicine has to be taken in a particular proportion what is the intelligence huh as prescribed because he has prescribed as prescribed so onion you have okay there are ayurvedic medications which have onion and garlic yes but they are not only onion and garlic see they're not like like pyaaz leke aana piece ke dena you can't this is a proportion okay that's a medicine uh so you don't make a medicine as your food even if theoretically speaking that conception is right which is still a concept then also you have to take it in a particular proportion not eating as a food and overdose and then end up with a damaged brain you know and krishna conscious reason is because there are the foods in the mode of ignorance uh, that's a krishna conscious reason we are trying to at least establish ourselves in mode of goodness but content high in sulfur or content high in pain like uh, like meat they can give upon giving you reasons you know what is the problem in the meat it's rich in this protein that that vitamin this this no krishna conscious reason is first of all the real reason is that krishna doesn't want it he doesn't say that in the categories of food that we can offer and then the thing is that this is the food which is rich in pain and i'm going to eat we are what we eat right i'm going to eat somebody's pain i'm not going to be established in goodness if i'm going to do that and that's not my goal of life i'm not putting something in my mouth so that i can taste it and then live through that <laughs> the goal is different i don't know if i answered your question you're tough you ask good questions you know what i mean is are you satisfied will you be able to say that now and tell them from all aspects दवाई खाना थोड़ी बना के खाओगे लाना डायबिटीज इंसुलिन लाना पीना है सो ओके सो हाउ द सेंसेस हाउ डज यू वॉक और हाउ द सेंसेस इंगेज दैट द पर्सन एक्चुअली अप्रोचेस सो वन इज पर्सन बिकम्स इन समाधि एंड देन वन इज अ साधका व्हाट इज द एग्जांपल ऑफ साधका दिस पर्टिकुलर चैप वर्स आई वाज रीडिंग लास्ट नाइट रॉब वाज एक्सप्लेनिंग द मीनिंग ऑफ द वर्ड साधका is a person who is practicing under the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master okay that doesn't mean that only initiated but shiksha guru and diksha guru both either at least one should have a shiksha guru if there is no diksha guru that is also well accepted in, accepted in our parampara right if you trace our parampara who is the guru of shri prabhupad who is the guru of shri prabhupad shri bhakti जगन्नाथ दास बाबा जी महाराज जगन्नाथ दास बाबा जी महाराज इज भक्ति विनोद ठाकुर शिक्षा गुरु नॉट दीक्षा गुरु सो व्हेन वी से प्रैक्टिस अंडर बोनाफाइड स्पिरिचुअल मास्टर इन आवर परंपरा बोथ आर गिवन इंपॉर्टेंस इफ समबडी डजंट मीन ओनली अ इनिशिएटेड डिसिपल कैन प्रैक्टिस कृष्ण कॉन्शियसनेस नो एन अनइनिशिएटेड डिसिपल कैन आल्सो डू दैट प्रोवाइडेड दे एट लीस्ट हैव अ सीरियस शिक्षा गुरु सो वन इज नीडेड आउट ऑफ द टू व्हिच वी लर्न फ्रॉम आवर परंपरा and of course if somebody becomes you know have a shiksha guru ultimately they will end up having a diksha guru it's so just a matter of time okay so activities are materialistic and transitory so like day and night right living entity there prabhupar explains there are two classes of intelligence one is materially active another one is an introspective sage in the cultivation of self realization person who is materially active that person's activities are considered to be night nisha right night and person who is spiritually active that person's activities are compared to the night the day so the night person cannot understand the day person's activities and the day person cannot understand the night person's activities you know uh, like for example a, a 
devotee of Krishna cannot understand how can you dance, drink wine and alcohol and dance all night in a club. How can you do that? What is there? You know, what is there? Ultimately, you get so tired at the end of the activity that you can't even function properly. Brushing teeth becomes a problem, you know? How can you do that? And then the person who's dancing in the bar cannot understand how can you get up at three in the morning and chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, same thing every single day of your life. So both cannot understand each other. Krishna is saying, don't, what does it mean to me when I read this? Why is Krishna mentioning this verse here, you know? One day I got the realization because he's saying that don't think that because you're trying to become Krishna conscious, you are trying to be understood by other people. And there's a high chance that we'll not be understood by actually people who we thought were understanding us. There's a high chance of actually canceling people out in that context. So this is my uh, personal take that Krishna is revealing this because don't think that you'll be understood or your activities will be understood. Um, so they're not disturbed. Very tough <clears throat> uh, shloka, Mataji. When night for all beings is the time of waiting for the self-control. And the time of awakening for all beings is the night of the introspective sage. Yeah. Does it, you know, sometimes like people say, oh, when you are, we are, uh, other people are sleeping, you are chanting. Is that your day and night? Brahmurata, people are sleeping. Yeah. And you are, yeah. the Krishna consciousness open, you are up and chanting. Yes, <clears throat> we can understand it literally from day and night. Yes. You can understand it literally from that aspect as well. Uh, but then there's a deeper meaning that the activities are not understood. We cannot understand. You know, let's go back to the Sanskrit Sanskrit mean, Sanskrit words Prabhupada is using in 69 verse. Ya nisha sarvabhuta nam tasyam jagrati samyami. So let me go back to the original Sanskrit. Because the Sanskrit word, I didn't want to go into it, but now you're bringing it up. The Sanskrit word has more uh meaning what does the word nisha mean what does the word jagrati mean these are the levels of consciousness right there are different levels um what is what are the three levels of consciousness when one is in the sleep jagrati uh so what are uh, ha, Mataji, so what is it yeah. uh, one is uh, jagrati one is sushupti uh sushupti i think is the deep sleep and, and there's a third uh, level. Jagruti, Anyone um, remembers? Essential and Bhagavatam. I actually one, have a Venn diagram. One is the sleep, like is the light sleep. One is the deep sleep and one is the state of awakeness. Uh, like the state where you are awake. No, I, I know the English words. I just don't know the Sanskrit words. So Jagrati means awake. So there are three levels of consciousness. One is uh, uh, awake. And another one is dreaming state. And then third one is deep sleep. Right? So Jagrati means awake. Awake in what? Awake in self-realization. One is literal awake. In a sleep study, if you say that somebody is awake and somebody is like in a dreaming stage and somebody is in a deep sleep, uh, we can take it as literally. But actually the word Jagrati in Sanskrit means one who is self, who is awake in self-realization. Not nothing to do with the day and night cycle, but awaken self-realization. There's a story associated with it. Krishna, Arjun is called Gudakesh, right? Because he has conquered the sleep and more of ignorance. How did he do that? One day he was eating food and and then suddenly in Mahabharata it's written, and I've heard from senior devotees. Now don't ask me where in Mahabharata because I've heard it from other devotees that uh, one day he was eating food and then suddenly it became very dark. The sun went down and he was still able to eat the food. Uh, so he thought that I can't actually see my hand, but my hand can find my mouth even when I can't see my hand. So that means that I should be able to shoot my target even if I'm not able to see the target in the dark. So when everyone was sleeping, he started practicing shooting arrows, you know, his archery in the dark. And then he became the expert archer. So what is from that? This is Jagriti doesn't mean sleeping or waking. Yes, you can take it like that. Yes, that's a superficial level, but it means the one who is awake in Krishna consciousness. 
So even that person is going to bed, that person is going to sleep with the intention that I have to get up with a refreshed self so I can continue with my Krishna conscious activities. That's Jagriti. But uh, Nisha, we can take that it is a night time or most of the Krishna conscious activities are not happening in the night time in the temple. There's regulation. We can take it like that, but also take it like that night means those activities are not interested. They're not of any interest to a person who's awake in Krishna consciousness. The lifestyle itself of a person who is not in Krishna consciousness is not very attractive to a self-realized soul. Prabhupada talks about it. He gives the example. He says, you know, when all these in political leaders hold big, big meetings and big, big agendas, he said there are so many. He said there are three crores. He gives number in the class. Three crores self-realized souls uh, in India who are very deep in their meditation on self-realization. We don't see them attending political parties. Do we see them attending those meetings? That, okay, such and such big leader of the country is holding such and such political agenda with the public. Are we seeing all these people coming out from their hermitages and attending? Okay, let's go hear what the political agenda is. We don't because they're not interested. So like that, that's, that's Nisha, that's night for them, uninterested. What is, okay. and then for a political leader, okay, you they may say, uh, very good that you're Krishna conscious. Very good you're chanting at Krishna. Continue. But do they do it? No. So that's the, basically for them, our activities are Nisha. So it can be used literally and it can also be used as a deep meaning. Did you get it? Got it. What is is right. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, one of the last verses in the chapter where Sita Pragna is unagitated by the desires. And the example given is that of an ocean. You know, the in the rainy season, when it's raining a lot and the rivers are flooding and they're going to the ocean, uh, the ocean doesn't become over flooded. It still re remains, Prabhupada uses the word in the puppet brink. It doesn't cross its brink. It remains undisturbed. Like that, these desires are there and we are there, but are we going to act on the desire? Having a desire is not sinful. Acting on the, uh, acting on the, uh, on that particular desire is is sinful. Having is not sinful. One can act as an observer, like observe that okay, now the mind is harboring this thought, that thought, this this thought. Now, person who are not self controlled don't have a choice. There's no element of choice. They get driven. It's like an animal, you know. It's like a, a, a dog. If you show that uh, dog some food object, they don't have a choice. They want to go and eat it. But if you sh show it to a person who's trying to become Krishna conscious, then there's a choice. And, okay, it's there. I can do it. I can go watch this movie. I can go. The bar is there. I have money. I can go. But do I want to go? What am I trying to accomplish? You know, that there's a, in, psycho, in the world of psychology, there's a good psychologist which happened uh, during the time of, uh, I think, World War II, Viktor Frankl. He said this, that uh, between the stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our choice to choose. And in our choice lies our freedom. So basically, I, I always feel maybe he should have chanted Hare Krishna because he act, act very close, you know, very close to the concept of Krishna consciousness. Between the stimulus and response, there is a, there is a space. And then in that space, there is a choice. And in that choice lies the freedom. So a living entity in the red box, if he's engaged in sense gratification, then... The senses are like fire, you know, you're like putting ghee. If you're gratifying, you're putting ghee in it. So if you put fire, ghee in the fire, it will only become more and more robust. So that person will never find peace because they're going to go and gratify the senses. On the other hand, if a person is engaging the senses in the service of the Lord and remains fully satisfied by transcendental loving service, then that person is not disturbed by the desires. The desires are there. Rivers are entering the ocean. The desires are coming. 
as long as we're in the material world, but are we getting disturbed and agitated is the big deal. You know, Prabhupada's disciple, Hridayananda Maharaj, he's a scholar in Sanskrit, right? He's the one who translated, along with some other devotees, 11th and 12th Cantor Shrimad Bhagavatam. He had come to Gidanagri last summer, and he was like talking about this, that what is the perversion? He was talking about what's the perversion? He said, the perversion is not that a man is developing an attraction for a woman or a woman is developing an attraction for a man. That's not the perversion. That's natural. What's the perversion is to become the only enjoyer. That's the perversion. This, the perversion is not that there is desire. The perversion is that I'm going to act on it so I can do sense gratification. Okay. So it's like uh, we develop like a kavach or like a protective shield around us by uh, actively engaging in Krishna's service. You know, uh, for me, personal inspiration is uh, Haridas Thakur's pastime. When the prostitute came to him, he didn't say, get out, Mataji, you are like an epitome of uh, Maya. He didn't, nothing. <laughs> you are disturbing my bhakti. Get out, get out. I have to now drink Ganga Jal and clean my house. My goodness, you entered, you made it imp impure. Nothing. What did he say? Sit down. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Let me just finish my chanting. I'll come to you. Just sit down. Under a chorus, sit down. So don't imitate, don't fake it, don't but take inspiration. Okay, so as long as we have material body, demands of the body will continue. Accept it. Don't fight it. But we then make the choice. The choice is am I going to act on it or not? Isn't isn't this verse so nice? This verse is so nice. So so Bhagavad, the seventy first person has given up all desires or person's gratification, false proprietorship, and false ego can attain or uh, can only attain peace. Not the person who's acting on it, because acting on it is like remember the example of putting clarified butter in the fire. It's gonna burn more, more and more and more. Okay, so living entity cannot really become desireless. Because we are spirit soul. A spirit soul is so active. And activity means that there are so many uh, desires to accomplish. The real desirelessness, no one can artificially abolish desire. The real desirelessness is, okay, I'm going to cook very nice food. But who's going to be the first enjoyer? The deity is in your house. That's real desirelessness. But a person who's not in Krishna consciousness, I have seen they taste the food while cooking the food. My God, can you even think like that while cooking? And our Madhavendra Puri pastime tells us, don't even think about tasting the food. Forget about literally doing it. Don't even think in the mind. We, we are trained like that. So desire for Krishna consciousness is arising from false ego. <laughs> what does ego mean? Identity. How am I identifying myself? So if I'm identifying myself as the servant of Krishna, then that's true ego. But if I'm identifying myself as the servant of my senses, then that's false ego. Person Krishna consciousness understands that actual position is it, uh, my actual position is I'm eternal servant of Krishna. And because Krishna is the uh, leader, then he's the proprietor, not falsely claiming proprietorship over any material things. And understand that Krishna is the actual proprietor and use everything in his service. The perfectional state of Krishna consciousness is attain perfect peace. That's where peace is. Not in sense gratification. Okay. At least for us. So this is the last verse that this way, this is the way to spiritual life one can attain even at the time of death. Khadamba Maharaj, Prabhupada gives example of him that he actually attained perfection few hours before his, a few moments before his death. So we'll start from this detail in Bhagavad Gita chapter 2. There's a detailed discussion on Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga and there's a glimpse of Bhakti, which is essentially the function of a living entity. Yeah, Khadvanga Maharaj. And by practicing Bhakti Yoga, we can attain Krishna consciousness even at time of death. But don't risk it. Don't risk it. You know, don't become like a Jamil. But it is possible, but don't risk it. And Prabhupada discusses about Nirvan. Nirvan in Buddha, Buddhist philosophy means that um, everything after death becomes zero. But here the word used is Brahma Nirvan. Brahma Nirvan means attaining Krishna consciousness in this life, which means going back to God, going back to Krishna. 
actual life begins after completion of material life in this very life so material so which leads to liberation from material bondage which leads to transcendental devotional service to krishna ultimate verdict of bhagavad gita is to become krishna conscious or develop devotional service to krishna right one devotee asked prabhupad prabhupad i want to be uh, attached to your lotus feet <laughs> prabhupad said that's a very difficult job so why because i'm always moving you see if you see prabhupad is always moving right he's never he's always moving from one country to another country one project to another project there's so many examples from prabhupad's life that we can accomplish that okay don't get stuck to one particular success that krishna might have given in in our practice of devotional service because that success if we get stuck can actually feed our pride so prabhupad gave example keep moving keep moving keep moving okay okay i think uh, uh, so work uh, certain like other people uh, but do not renounce work but internally you become renounce and attack get attached to krishna that's where the distinguishing is I will come to the summary, the section part. So go back and read the chapter again. Doesn't mean the class is over, the chapter is over. Uh, these are the sections that we discussed. 72 verses, long chapter. Um, from verse 1 to 10, the relationship between Arjuna and Krishna changes, where Arjuna actually becomes a devoted uh, disciple of Krishna. Then Krishna starts, uh, answers the question uh, of compassion by giving him the evidence of the soul in verse 11 to 30, that your compassion is wrongly directed. Your compassion has to be directed to the soul. And then he gives karma kandi avichar from verse 31 to 38, which is an answer to that I'm not going to enjoy. Well, you're going to enjoy. If you win the kingdom, you'll enjoy. If you lose the kingdom, you'll enjoy the heavenly kingdom, heavenly planets. Then 39 to 53, Krishna gives a verdict of the Vedas like how and the flowery language of the Vedas. And towards the end, he says, rise above the dualities of the Vedas, the flowery language of the Vedas. At that point, and he describes that become situated in the self. That point, Arjuna asked the question, the last section, that uh, what is the language? What are the symptoms? How does this person sit and how does this person walk? Sita Pragna. And that's what we discussed. An ultimate word is action. You know, fight. It's action. Okay, next time when we meet on Sunday, next Sunday we will discuss what are first questions first and then we'll start chapter 3. Uh, so please read chapter 3. I can tell you how many verses. Stop the recording.